Good afternoon, welcome to the ISS. I am Virginia Comoli, Senior Fellow for Conflict, Security and Development. Uh, welcome to the second installment of our uh, monthly series of ISS conflict uh, briefings. So every, every month we gather together to zoom in on a conflict. As you may know, uh, ISS produces quite a lot of conflict-related uh, analysis and we would like to always find new ways to share that knowledge with you and to also um, get your views and feedback on how our data and analysis can better help you in your work. So please do uh, share your thoughts and feedback with us uh, afterwards. So um, this, uh, this month we are focusing on the, on the Ukraine. Uh, with us from the Ukraine is our uh, uh, ACD, Armed Conflict Database, Conflict Researcher, Elliot Dolan Evans. Um, he has been spending the past four weeks conducting field research in Ukraine, and so we are very lucky to have him with us today to share his first-hand experience. Um, Elliot uh, works on the Armed Conflict uh, Database and is also uh, pursuing a PhD at Monash University, where he's researching the impact of post-conflict economic restructuring on women's participation. Also here with us, we have a long-standing friend of the Bolaida Boles, uh, Dr. Samir Puri, who is an ISS consulting member and a lecturer in war studies at King's College, just down uh, the road. He has previously worked with the uh, Foreign and Commonwealth uh, Office and was seconded in 2014 and 2015 to the OSCE, where he was in uh, eastern uh, Ukraine. And he also is the author on a, of an Adelphi book that we published a couple of years ago on non-state uh, armed groups. You'll see it in the display cabinet outside and you can buy it downstairs before you leave if you want to. Uh, so the, the aim of the sessions is to, to, to keep it quite informal and quite interactive. We won't have formal presentations, but I will try to tease out some um, some of the key themes in a conversation with uh, Samir and, and Elliot, and then we'll have ample time for, for you to share your thoughts and also uh, ask, uh, ask questions. As we, uh, as we do so, we'll also show you some of the data uh, and maps that we uh, generate as part of the armed conflict uh, database, and you see it in, in, in the background as well. So, um, just, just, to, uh, just to start, really, I'd like to ask you, Samir, first, and, and, and Elliot, uh, if you could give us a sense of what the uh, state of the conflict is right now in, in Ukraine. Yeah, I think, I mean, in a word, for a wider audience, the state of the conflict is actually forgotten. Uh, there is still a conflict going on. There are still an inordinate amount of ceasefire violations, of, of weapons being used across the line of contact, but the conflict, uh, as far as a global audience is concerned, has largely, I think, fallen off the media map. In terms of, uh, well, the evolution of the conflict, um, certainly the year I was there, 2014 to 15, there's still a sense of dynamism to the military aspect of uh, the conflict around the line of contact. There were still cities that were being retaken and taken by force. That has gradually petered out, and I think this has probably contributed to the fact that it doesn't get as much media attention. There isn't really anything unlike, for example, in Syria to report, well, this has changed hands between one side and the other. Um, the two sides, uh, in terms of the front line, are not very far apart from each other. I mean, as you drive from one you know, separatist-controlled territory to Ukraine armed forces-controlled control territory, you really don't go across very much ground. And of course, there are still probing attacks, there's still artillery fire, but there isn't the change of, uh, change of ownership of territory. As a result, it's stalemate. Yeah. Elliot, any thoughts on, on, on what the fight yeah, looks like at the moment? Yeah, double bit sure. And um, I think uh, I echo like Samir's thoughts on this as, as well, because, you know, the forgotten conflict, I think, is also an issue um, in Ukraine itself in, in a lot of places. A lot of uh, political uh, party representatives and activists I've spoken to here, one of the, the biggest concerns is that it's hard to engage um, what you might call, you know, normal Ukrainians in, in Kiev and even in places close to the conflict like Kharkiv and Dnipro. Um, uh, you know, in, in the conflict as well, because, uh, you know, you can be here and, and not realise there's one happening just a few hundred kilometres away. 
Um, and yeah, you know, I, I think um, I've heard it being described as a, as a frozen conflict, and I don't think that's entirely right because every day there's shelling, there's deaths, there's you know injuries on on either side. So, but it, it is very much a stalemate. There's not a lot of exchange of territory, but it's still very much um, an active conflict, and that's probably what I'd add at the moment. Sure. And, and how about the actors? You know, the groups involved uh, in in the conflict have they changed over time? Have you noticed anything worth mentioning? Yeah, I mean, of course, the, the important thing to point out about my role seconded to the OSCE is, and this is one of the aspects of the mission we'll talk about later on, I'm sure, is we're never there to conduct investigations in terms of uh, what's happening or actors involved. But certainly from, uh, from seeing the conflict unfold, um, there was actually for quite a long time something people don't realise, a certified Russian uniformed military presence allowed in the war zone. This was something uh, called the JCCC, which was a bilateral agreement between the Ukrainian armed forces and the Russian armed forces, which allowed uh, for actually quite senior ranking Russian general and his staff to be deployed with Ukraine's permission um, along the front line territory. And so certainly the year I was there, and actually the Russians had withdrawn from that uh, a little while back from that particular mission. It was largely ineffectual. It was sort of badged as being able to provide uh, some sort of bilateral control uh, a monitoring mechanism between the two armed forces. But the dynamics between the Russian armed forces personnel and the separatists, you know, make no mistake, when you walked into a room and they were both there, you could clearly tell who was in charge. There was a sort of Russian general, Lentsov, a uh, very senior Russian general who was actually promoted in the time he was there in 2015. Um, and then, of course, the Donetsk People's Republic and Luhansk People's Republic representatives. A lot, a lot younger. One of them looked like he was about 15, wearing his dad's uniform. And I, I sort of joke there, but it really was a sense that this is a professional military interacting uh, with a lot of people who were self-starters, didn't really have that background. Mm. So, Elliot, we are talking about Russia. So what do you think are the Russians, uh, what are they trying to achieve with their current level of support for the uh, separatist groups? Um, like to, to me as a, as a conflict uh, analysis, um, you know, looking to the, this conflict regularly, I think it's, it's very much geopolitically in, in Russia's interest to have this conflict kind of boiling away because I think it inhibits um, Ukraine's accession in, into uh, NATO. It, it still, you know, presents a, a dividing line in, in Ukrainian society, and and there's still a lot of um, tension and and you know, sub conflict boiling away in a lot of um, cities in in Ukraine. And I think um, this kind of status quo is is very beneficial for Russia geopolitically, so they don't have a, a, a you know a NATO uh, country on on their doorstep, um, and also in terms of the local people on the ground in Donetsk and Luhansk. Um, the, I've just heard today, actually, from a number of activists that there's a lot of kind of uh, money changing hands to help people go back and forth towards the border and, um, you know, in terms of smuggling goods, people trafficking and so forth. Like, there's there's a lot of reasons for local actors as well to want to prolong this conflict too. Um, yeah, and I think the dynamic is, is definitely changing on the, on, on the ground, echoing Simia's um, thoughts at, at the moment. I think I'll just add that, um, of course, the actual active conflict is in the Donbass, in the eastern part of the country. It's interesting what that has served in the past for Ukraine. I mean, my sense with the Crimean annexation is that the fact there wasn't really an active conflict over the annexation of Crimea, we all remember the little green men, um, the fact there, was, there were lives being lost in the east of the country drew attention away from Crimea. That became the first order of priority in terms of conflict resolution. And still echoing Elliot's comments there, it's, um, you know, the target is Kiev in terms of its political calculus, its decision-making abilities, its autonomy as a sovereign political actor to be able to choose its fate between um, allying with Eastern or Western structures. That's the real target. The Donbass war is a means to achieving that influence. And whether that uh, has changed in the Russian calculus or not is, of course, you know, the million ruble question, mm. which uh, no one is in a position to be able to, to answer. Um, but we can, of course, go into some of the details around the factors around why Russia might, might change its mind in the near future. Sure. Yeah. Um, you've mentioned uh, the conflict is predominantly in Donbass, but can you also tell us a bit more about the, the broader impact of the conflict there and more broadly, as I said, on the... Uh, 
in the country in terms of the humanitarian impact, also the impact on um, physical infrastructure and also on the um, on the economy. Yeah, there is a, and again echoing the comments we've just heard, it's you know, it's a tale of two countries almost in the sense you can go to Kiev and many people do as academics or politicians or or uh, diplomats and engage with the Kiev elite. And the war simply doesn't have any sensory impact on your time in the country at all. It's very far away. I mean, Ukraine geographically is it's a large country. It would take, you know, almost an overnight train journey to get out from Kiev over to the east anyhow. Um, all those contrasts in terms of where allegiances have lain in the past within Ukrainian society, that, of course, I would say if Vladimir Putin tossed an lighted match, there was some kindling to, to catch light. Uh, in my time there, of course, the, the economic impact of the conflict is the one that's been felt predominantly by people not immediately next to the front line. Mm. Um, obviously, the, uh, the issues of the loss of their, their major trading neighbour, Russia, um, has had a dramatic impact on small, medium industries and enterprises uh, on, on the local economy. Um, but the humanitarian impact, the negative humanitarian impact of ongoing active conflict is principally being felt by um, the people who live in the East, and the real spillover, probably for the rest of Ukrainian society, is economic. It's the internally displaced people, which is a huge, huge issue in terms of the, uh, the way in which Ukrainian society interprets this uh, conflict. But also the number of Ukrainian armed forces personnel who've now served in the Donbass and, of course, have rotated back, whether as uniformed military or as what were previously known as those self-starting volunteer battalions. There's been a lot of the fighting for the Ukrainian uh, cause uh, independently in the early part of the conflict. So the spillover is there to the rest of the country, but it's not as apparent mm. as you might think. And actually, a lot of the rest of the country is incredibly safe. You just wouldn't know that there is a war going on in many parts of the rest of Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, Elliot, of course, as part of uh, your research for the armed conflict <coughs> database, you've been collecting lots of data also that uh, measures the impact of, of the conflict. Would you like to share any, any thoughts on that, on, on especially on the humanitarian side of things? Yeah, absolutely. And it's a big uh, focus of my PhD topic as, as well. And, and, you know, just to, again, echo Samir's thoughts uh, at the macro level, the war in Donbass has obviously taken out a huge amount of Ukrainian uh, industry. Um, they're obviously, uh, you know, areas that uh, have a lot of coal and other resource mining, a lot of land of the black earth, Ukraine's famous um, agricultural soil. So the, there's a huge impacts on the macroeconomic factors. But you know, looking at the, the microeconomic stuff and, and talking about IDPs, uh, I think a few, maybe two weeks ago now, we've had new data that there's uh, over 1.7 million registered IDPs now from the Donbass. And the, the I've, I've spoken to a lot of uh, IDP groups here in Ukraine and the, the struggle for IDPs are, are enormous. Um, a lot of the IDPs coming from the Donbass are often um, single women with uh, children and often have to also look after parents as well. Um, and not only do they face like some a discrimination community, which is getting better, but they also have a, a huge amount of difficulty finding jobs in an otherwise already depressed economic environment. Um, it's almost difficult and impossible for them to, uh, you know, rent. Um, and the utility prices are basically impoverishing huge amounts of um, people here. So you can really see in, in some of the places like Nipro and Kharkiv, which have a huge IDP population, um, a lot of the people are really struggling. There's noticeable poverty on, on the street um, and people are doing anything they can to make, make ends meet. Um, and uh, another interesting uh, point of this, sorry, and I'll just end on this, is um, the, the pensioners. So the occupied territories have a large number of, of, of pensioners and old people who, you know, maybe couldn't flee or didn't want to. And to collect that pension, they have to go over the conflict line and register and then come back and then repeat that process every two month, months. And this can be like, you know, a 16 hour journey. Um, and it's really a pittance of, of what, what they get, but they need it to survive. And um, this kind of movement of people back and forth is thousands upon thousands, um, you know, a week. Um, and it's very tough for them. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Though. There's a lot more to be said. But, yeah. but do, do they get any form of help or aid, support? Yeah, like, you know, the, there is a very, like, uh, talking, so for IDPs, for the um, 
after they're registered for the first three months, I'm pretty sure they don't get anything. And then um, then they get, I think, 400 revna like a, a month, which, um, yeah, I was, that's like the cost of two lunches. Um, to put it in perspective, um, and then pensioners as well have a monthly pension. I think they're a little over a thousand rivna, and again, you know, I think that that barely covers uh, utility costs. Um, so most people have to also work. You see a lot of pensioners on the street here selling, um, you know, flowers, their produce from their own little subsistence farming, um, and they do anything really to get by and like I said there's a huge amount of poverty in the street and just to echo Samir's comments quickly you also have all these veterans coming back from the war who are, are crippled and and unable to to work and they have to be looked for by their family because there's just not the social structures to look after them in Ukraine because the economy is being gutted you know they have to provide all this social services whilst in a war um, economy and huge amounts of money going to the military so yeah and I, I would also add because there's a there's that wider societal impact across the country then there's the, the acute situation around the line of contact itself for those people who are affected by, by intermittent shelling. Um, I went back after I'd finished my time at the, uh, at the OSC mission by the time I was a lecturer, went back for a, a British charity Peaceful Change Initiative to write a paper on the uh, human security dimensions of life in the East with Donbass. There are a set number of crossing points across the front line. And the reason why that's really significant is that this is a war that divided families in many cases. In some cases, I even anecdotally heard of you know, some friends of mine whose marriage had broken up local uh, Ukrainians because the husband was actually sympathetic to the separatists when they actually rolled across. I've heard the same. Yeah, and the, and the wife absolutely wasn't. She, her allegiance was maybe not necessarily to the Kiev government, which is the important point. It was, I guess, agnostic as in I just don't want a conflict here and I certainly don't support the separatists. So that sort of breaking up of families, that sort of driving apart of people. Also, the pensioners point is important. Um, something that happened in this conflict hasn't produced perhaps as many refugees outside of the region as other conflicts has. It's the internally displaced peoples that's the issue. If you have the means, you probably got as far as you could from the front line, maybe going all the way to Lviv or somewhere in the centre of Ukraine, starting your life again. If you're a lot poorer, you probably couldn't get that far away. So you end up in somewhere like Dnipro or Kharkiv, which isn't all that far away from the war zone. In some cases, pensioners or very elderly members of your family, they wouldn't be able to go with you. They wouldn't have the, either the desire or the physical capacity. So this need to actually cross that front line, and sometimes it's as mundane as, well, actually my house that I own is still in Donetsk in separatist controlled territory. I'd like to go back and check on my property. Maybe that's the person's major assets. Um, there have been lots of queues, there have been, there's been an imperfect system to facilitate the crossing of that front line. And some of these civilian casualties that have been registered in the last couple of years have been people trying to circumnavigate those crossing points. Uh, taking, for example, a private minibus that uh, in some cases they get across. Other cases, tragically, they've hit a landmine, um, killing people on board or someone has stumbled. There's also a black market that sprung up across that front line because of the paucity of goods that are available uh, in the separatist controlled territories and also the expected price inflation uh, in Ukraine as a whole, which has changed uh, the, the cost of living for many people. Thank you. Uh, Samir, I'd like to go back to something that you mentioned earlier on when you uh, uh, mentioned the JCCC. Uh, so yeah. there are a number of international missions in the Ukraine. How would you assess their performance? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the Minsk process, which of course is the thing that the OSC presides over, that was actually very early on in the in the conflict in the end of 2014 uh, with a sort of a modification in February 2015. That's the di diplomatic structure for managing the conflicts. I think with regards to the assessment of the OSCE mission, uh, it's, I think it's very easy to criticise it because obviously it hasn't been able to bring about an end to the conflict. But I think the important th distinction to bear in mind is between conflict resolution and conflict management. Um, the geopolitics of this conflict uh, is something so complex, so entrenched in East-West relations that you know, we don't need a reminder as to why there's an intractable element to the wider issue. But I think um, when it comes to conflict management, all well, this whole sort of new Cold War rhetoric is actually not very helpful. You need to actually look at the situation in Ukraine, look at trying to, in the case of managing this conflict, uh, preventing escalation. And I go back to my original point at the start of our discussion, which is... In 2014, the shape of the conflict, where the front line sat, was not at all preordained. Uh, there, has, there was a possibility that the separatist forces could have actually taken a lot more territory than they did. 
Um, if I was to make a judgment with regards to the OSC special monitoring mission and the OSC's uh, diplomacy through the tri trilateral contact group, is it's prevented conflict escalation. It's also helped to control elements of the conflict. There's no air war over Ukraine, hugely significant. We think about Syria, we think about the rapidity and the brutality with which cities were taken and retaken. Uh, particularly after MH17, there was a lot more effort put into control of the airspace. This is the downed Malaysian airliner in summer 2014. Um, this may have also helped to put a little bit of a handbrake on uh, the dynamism of the conflict. That's probably, I'll end there in terms of the OSC. Just to, just to round off on that, there's a change of uh, leadership there. Alexander Hug, the uh, deputy, principal deputy chief monitor, has just come to the end of his tenure. Um, and the OSC has just announced his replacement, Mark Etherington, uh, who's got a lot of experience in post-conflict settings. He was actually involved in the OSC SMM at the very start in 2014, uh, just a bit before I got there. Um, but it's interesting because you know, Alexander Hogg has been very uh, public in talking about, uh, just to paraphrase his words, and this is someone involved at the very direct level in terms of shuttling between the different sides of the front line, but also capitals. The thing, is, the thing that's absent is political will. The technical uh, steps to actually de-escalate the conflict. This is something I was involved in with Underground, which is you know, people being forced to pull back their heavy weapons you know, a, certain, a certain distance away from the front line. The problem was with the OSCE, we didn't patrol at night. So at night, those weapons could be moved back. Since I've left, there have been some innovations in terms of patrol hubs, um, which are embedded in certain hotspots or around hotspots. Uh, greater use of uh, cameras, greater use of, of drones as well to develop more of a picture. But nonetheless, holding people to account over this is something the OSC mission doesn't necessarily have uh, the mandate to do. It can just publicise the fact that violations of the ceasefire have occurred and then it's the issue of political will. Is there the political will to actually take those steps and commit to them? Mm, interesting. Uh, Elliot, what do you make of all these different uh, missions in Ukraine? Um, I'll, I'll just add just a little bit because I think Samir has explained it very well, and I think the you know the OSCE role of the monitoring mission is, is has been very important um, to highlight uh, you know breaches in the ceasefire, which is which is daily, but also um, movements of significant weaponry around the the front line, um, and also movement of weaponry into and out of Russia as well. Uh, and a comment about the peace process, uh, you know, the Minsk and the the, for, the the Normandy format as well have both kind of hit a, a roadblock. Um, I think in July or June, July, September, you know, September there was the harvest and the um, school time tru uh, truces, which both broke down within, you know, two hours. Um, so, and, and Russia, I think, have stopped engaging with the Normandy um, format uh, of peace negotiations after the latest uh, killing of the um, Donetsk separatist leader a month or so ago. Um, so yeah, it's really uncertain how much more progress we'll get here. And, and just very quickly, I just want to mention the human international humanitarian organizations have been crucial for a lot of um, uh, people here in, in Ukraine, and, and they're really stepping in and providing services that um, the state can't um, themselves provide. So, you know, they have that very important task too. And of course, the other issue, of course, as well, if the OSC mission as I'd often say at the time when I was there, it's sort of a sticking plaster on a bit of a gaping wound, but without that sticking plaster, you've got pretty much nothing. Um, the proposal or the hypothesis of a UN role mm. is something that's been bounced backwards and forwards uh, in relation to the Ukrainian conflict. Uh, Poroshenko, President Poroshenko, in some of his sort of dark moments when the, you know, the conflict was escalating, would say, we need a you know, fully armed, you know, open mandate with regards to the Security Council mission. To, uh, to secure uh, the territory, to retake the territory. Of course, you know, the Russians are very unlikely to allow, sign anything off like that. But you know, the Russian counter-proposal is an interesting one, which is to provide effectively through a UN uh, police presence, um, armed escorts to the OSC monitors. So that's been the sort of the Russian line, which is I don't disagree in principle with the idea, but it's more that the OSC would remain uh, the, 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 the principal res international responder. There have been other uh, discussions as to, and the Kurt Volker is an important figure here. This is the US government's uh, front person in dealing with uh, the sort of high level diplomacy around the conflict. I mean, Kurt Volker's prognosis publicly, again, is actually pretty, pretty bleak. There isn't a great deal of optimism coming from his comments that he gives publicly in, in think tanks and other things in the US. 
Um, I think he's reduced it to, to the, like the following possible trade-off, which is, this is something I'm sure we'll talk about in a moment, uh, forthcoming Ukrainian elections in March 2019. Mm. Is it really the case that actually where we are right now in November 2018, we're almost in a bit of a political stasis with regards to how you know, the political deck chairs will be realigned in Kiev? Um, is it that the Russians effectively want a, well, not, not a pliant government, but a less hostile government in Kiev? Whereas you know, the West and the US in particular, the line that's being pushed is, well, Ukrainian sovereignty needs to be restored across the Donbass. Mm. If I were to simplify it, those are probably the two top line demands coming from the Western capitals and from Moscow. Yeah. Well, you mentioned the uh, elections. I would be interested in hearing from Elliot what he's hearing uh, on the ground regarding the upcoming elections. So, so w what's your sense? What, what's the likely outcome? Uh, I think like from a lot of the people I've spoken to here, they, they feel that the election, um, which the, so the presidential elections are scheduled for March um, next year and the parliamentary of Verkhno Radna elections will be shortly after that. Um, and there, there's a feeling here that this could mark a, a turning point and we're still kind of waiting for, I guess, clear political messages from the leaders, how they're going to um, approach the, the conflict. So there seems to be the thought that either it will be a, an escalation or one wanting to try to be more decisive in getting an outcome or, or another point of, um, you know, more reconciliation and, and so forth. And, uh, and it seems to me that Ukrainian society is quite divided on this. There's a, there's a kind of resurgent nationalistic element here, which is also um, backed by more, uh, I guess, like far right, um, far right groups who have, uh, they're, they're not as big as, as somewhere maybe like in Germany, but they, they're de definitely very present. And even me walking around the streets, you can see their presence, you can see their graffiti and, and marks, um, and uh, they're very visible. Um, and so, yeah, there's this, there's this kind of notion that um, this election might be really important and we might see a bit of a push from uh, a leader who will want to get those nationalistic elements um, on on board because there's there's just so much discourse and rhetoric around you know protecting the nation um, that we're seeing uh, here in, in Kiev in, in political discussions. Okay so if you were to look into your crystal ball how do you think this uh, scenario that you just described is likely to affect the uh, the conflict itself? Um, yeah, it's, look, it's really hard to say, and it seems like for the uh, the presidential elections, it's kind of a race. It seems like between Poroshenko and, and Timoshenko, um, and it, it's it's really difficult to make a prediction. I don't know if, if Samir can um, help me out a, a little bit, but you know, I think um, there is some signs that there might be further mo mobilisation and further deployment there is kind of suggestions that they might have another volunteer call up to the military. Um, and so there, there might be more of, more of a, a push that way too. But I'm keen to hear Samir's thoughts. Oh, nicely nicely battled yeah. over it. So I'd actually, uh, before I was uh, involved in the OSC SMM, I'd been an OSC election observer. Uh, actually, the Orange Revolution is one of the first things I did in my working life back in 2004. And again, in parliamentary elections in 2006 and seven. So there are some, I wouldn't call them iron laws as far as Ukrainian politics are concerned, but things like accusations of corruption mm. being used to scuttle particular uh, political figures, you know, great political comebacks, the fact that Timoshenko is a credible candidate. Um, if you had if you had a time machine and you were able to go back, that would seem quite strange because she was discredited at a certain period in Ukraine's not-too-distant past. Mm. Um, it's hard to say, of course, whether the conflict will have a particular impact on the politics. Of course, the question is, will the politics impact the conflict? I think actually at the moment the question is the extent to which the conflict will impact the politics. There's probably more dynamism in the politics than there is in the conflict itself. And this is a thing that goes back to, you know, from a, one would hypothesize a Russian perspective, is if you turn this conflict into a constant in Ukrainian economic, political, diplomatic life, uh, then you're effectively looking at the ways in which it distorts and pushes and pulls different factors within sort of the Ukrainian body politic. And something else I'd just point out, because obviously I can't call you know, the election from where we sit now at all, other than to say the conflict will, of course, be one of the principal ways in which different candidates demonstrate their patriotism, their commitment to the cause, appealing to different constituencies. 
But something, and I, I don't know whether Elliot's got his own perspectives on this uh, being there at the moment, something I've been a little bit alarmed by is a, a sort of soundbite diagnosis of Ukraine, which is especially prevalent in the West, which is there's nothing like the war to have driven greater united spirit within the Ukrainian population. There's nothing like the war and Russia's role to have driven greater patriotism. Um, I certainly think that's true in parts of the country, but that's really the key. Um, it's a nice sort of counter-Russian piece of rhetoric, but there's still a lot of division within Ukrainian society. Some of the most uh, vocal Ukrainian patriots and nationalists, of course, they are soldiers or volunteer battalion soldiers who have cycled out of the conflict. So they've, of course, seen the conflict uh, you know, with their own eyes. There are a lot of armchair warriors in places like Lviv, which is as far away from the battlefront as you can get, who are, of course, some of the most enthusiastic Ukrainian nationalists. And again, there is a danger from a Western perspective of traveling to the West, traveling to, of, of Ukraine, traveling to Kiev, and just hearing those messages, which is we're totally united against the Russians. Actually, it's a large country. There's a, there's a large population. And those individual opinions that have been formed by the impact of the conflict with regards to, well, it doesn't mean, you know, I'm not a card-carrying separatist, someone in the east of the country might say. I don't want to join the separatists. I don't want to be part of Russia. But I just don't really like the spirit of politics in Kiev either. Mm. I feel alienated, effectively, from both sides. And there is that sort of lost constituency. You, know, you can't put numbers on it. You can't necessarily trace it on a map. And I think there is a lot of, uh, there are a lot of, I guess, people who are agnostic and just probably just exhausted by the conflict. Whether they will vote, whether they'll abstain, whether their votes are up for grabs from different messages, I think those are important things to take into account. Mm. So do, do you uh, expect or foresee uh, a um, disinformation campaign in the lead up to the election, cyber attacks even, or other forms of election meddling? Um, I mean, it's, it's, I suppose I must mention the term hybrid war at this point. It's a term with my academic hat on I've never really liked because I always say to my students, well, when was a war not hybrid? I mean, when was a war just waged on the basis of a single method? When was it not accompanied with, by subversion as well? Mm. Now, of course, there's been a change, a step change in terms of the tools through which subversion is being pursued. Um, but the fact that there will still be a huge propaganda battle over Ukrainian hearts and minds, I think, is a given. But I'd also say, and this goes back to my previous experiences, between 2004 and Yanukovych, of course, who was the, the president who was overthrown in the Ma Maidan revolution, he lost in 2004. He staged a political comeback, um, possibly with the help of Paul Manafort, as we've now found out through some of the revelations around uh, uh, that community of, of people and Republican campaign uh, advisers. But the point being is that scandal hopefully highlights uh, the, the dirty games that have been played over the political oscillations that have already happened in Kiev, between candidates who are, you know, in theory more less more hostile to the Russia and are more pro-West and, and vice versa as well, could Ukraine experience another dramatic pendulum swing? I don't think it will be quite that dramatic, and that's probably the impact the war will have. It will probably embed a, a nationalist lobby that is able to uh, able to retain power in Kiev. Whether they can actually, whether they have the authority. Um, and the moral intellectual authority over the entire swathe of their, their populace. That's the question. And the longer that line of control, line of contact rather, exists in the East, this is a point I made in the NGO paper I wrote, it's not quite like the Berlin Wall. But imagine if, if that line had been abrogated after a year of conflict, it had been an emergency, it was resolved. Yes, those divided families, those divided friendships, they could come back together. The longer they're separate, the more they're susceptible to different propaganda messages, different campaigning messages, the harder it will actually be to, to then integrate, reintegrate people. It's not ethnic war, it's not like the Balkans or anything like mm. this in terms of the way in which attitudes are formed in relation or in opposition to each other. But people are physically separated and they're being bombarded with quite contradictory messages. And that I think will also be a dynamic, if not in this election, but certainly for Ukraine's medium term future. Sure. Thank you. Elliot, anything to add on this final point? Uh, just, you know, partly echoing Samir, Samir's thoughts that, um, you know, Ukraine isn't a homogenous um, society. Like, they, 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 there's people from, you know, as everyone probably knows, with, like, Polish heritage, Hungarian heritage, um, Russian heritage. There's significant Roma population. There's the uh, Tatars as well. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think that there's, uh, like Samir has said, that there's this 
great meta narrative of everyone banding together against Russia. I don't think it's quite that simple, um, and that's why these, you know, the nationalists far-right parties in Ukraine, even though they're quite visible and loud, they don't actually command a lot of electorate votes. A lot, a, In fact, a lot of, um, you know, kind of what might say regular people um, find them, you know, quite ridiculous. Um, and, you know, I think uh, we'll probably keep seeing more propaganda going up to the election. As a conflict analyst, um, you know, you read lots of different things in Russia, always puts this as, uh, you know, they're, they're, the separatists are fighting off the, the fascists and, um, uh, you know, homosexuals from Kiev um, and they're protecting, you know, the, the Russian-speaking population and, you know, they'll, I'm sure they'll just be, you know, magnified even more. And um, I, I agree with Samir too. I think it's this conflict has, has really divided families and, and divided marriages and it, it's really torn a, a line through a lot of um, communities here and the peace building effort and the reconciliation once this war is, is done is going to be enormous. Thank you. Well, we covered quite a wide ground here, but I think it's time now to open up uh, for comments and questions from uh, from the floor. Uh, I should have said this at the outset, but the whole session is on the record, so your questions and comments will also be uh, on the record, and we are recording at this session. You'll be able to watch it again afterwards if you want to or share it with your uh, contacts. So if you would like to uh, make a comment, just, okay, catch my eye. Okay, uh, Antonio, would you like to introduce yourself as well? Yes, so the first question comes from the House. Uh, I work at the Conflict Security Development Program of Buenos Aires. Um, so uh, I wonder um, how the current state of the conflict is affecting cities, because the uh, Ukraine conflict has been uh, sort of a, an example of how, or a bad example of how uh, conflicts have affected cities and the whole kind of hybrid warfare kind of narrative was very much uh, to that extent that um, the armed groups were able to hide in the, in the towns and cities. Um, from the point of view of uh, our research here on urbanization, it's quite frustrating not to have a lot of information from this sort of hidden conflict of, of Ukraine because um, it has affected cities quite tremendously. I wonder if this has continued now. Um, you said that the conflict has continued to some extent. Mm. Uh, is that located in cities and how it's affected the day-to-day -day, um, functioning of those areas? Yeah, I mean, um, it's now been a few years since I, I lived in, in Donetsk itself, 2014-15, but obviously that was being, that's the capital of the so-called Donetsk People's Republic. It was actually quite astonishing to, to a certain extent how everyday life seemed to just be carrying on, uh, aside from the artillery barrages that were being fired either across or over the city. Um, and you, of course, get tragic incidents of artillery hitting. Uh, and I actually genuinely think often it by accident hitting civilians. Something that is a characteristic of the conflict, which I think is very important to bear in mind, and I've heard different explanations as to why this is the case, uh, is the co-location of military facilities or posts or the adjacent location between them and civilian conurbations. Um, I heard speculation from colleagues, I don't know if this is necessarily true, that there was something around what was Soviet military doctrine in terms of lines of supply that actually you would base yourself quite close to cities and therefore power and, and supplies. I don't know whether that's actually a rationale for it. Certainly something the OSCE pushed, which it was quite importantly, was don't park your soldiers for both sides actually in and around villages and cities. Because you know the, this is not high-tech equipment that's being fired. Something else that I think disabuses a hybrid war characterization, which is all very futuristic. You know, so I got there 100 years after World War I, you know, 2014, and trenches and artillery pieces being fired from fixed positions. And the multiple launch rocket systems, the MLRS systems, they're not smart munitions. And as a result, you know, you get a trolley bus, the Marshukas, you know, occasionally being destroyed, people being killed there. Um, something else in terms of cities, and this again, this is elements both sides have, have, have done this in the past, is commandeering things like schools. And um, this is from uh, more smaller villages that may have been abandoned or largely depopulated because of the proximity of the conflict. But again, soldiers you know, from both sides obviously going for the larger structures and sort of occupying those and the impact that that then has on, on people who might still be around those areas. Elliot, how do you see the conflict impacting cities? 
Uh, well, discussing from my experiences, I've travelled through Odessa, Nipro, and Kharkiv recently, which are kind of the three major cities uh, geographically closest to the um, conflict. And I, you know, I think if you live in those cities, you can certainly forget that there's there's a war going on. Um, like there's obviously no no shelling or or uh, obvious violent conflict in in a way. Um, however, having said that. You can definitely notice a lot of military mobilisation. I often see lots of um, you know military personnel um, going going about their day and um, you know going to uh, you know training grounds which are very very close close by. And there there is a lot of simmering tension, especially in places like Odessa, which is a very um, uh, dynamic and um, yeah you know multi cultural kind of um, centre and often you you know you see and hear even when I was there for a, for a week of violence between um, pro Russian and pro you know Ukrainian people and so there's a lot of tension still unresolved um, in some of the big cities and and Odessa of course if anyone remembers there was the the trade union burnt down in 2014 with a lot of pro Russian um, people in there and the investigation is very sluggish and ongoing and you know that non resolution of this kind of violence has has uh, yeah, perpetuated conflicts between people in, in in the cities. So yeah, you know, I think you can you can definitely live and, and not feel like there is a war going on, but you do see the social uh, impacts in terms of the the conflict, in terms of the poverty, um, and um, you know the IDPs as well. Thank you. Uh, the lady in the second row. Sorry, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Javella, I'm from the Henry Jackson Society. Thank you. And a former student at King's, actually, yeah. I should have said. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a very interesting question. Again, you, there's probably multiple perspectives. I'll put it in these terms. The month I left Ukraine, my, my year had come to an end there, was September 2015, so when I started at King's. And coincidentally, that's the month that Russia's overt military uh, campaign in Syria began. Uh, just to refresh our memories, it's now been you know, just over two, you know, three years coming up. That took a lot of attention away from Ukraine, a lot. And I think Syria, it's a slightly different magnitude. Of course, it's produced the refugee crisis. There's a crossover with the narrative of international terrorism, jihadist terrorism. Somehow the cocktail in Syria and the scale of Syria monopolized things. Russia's involvement in Syria is overt. Its uh, uh, role in Ukraine has been superficially veneer thin deniable, covert, but that's a line that's maintained, which is also quite a striking feature. That's one thing, I guess, it's uh, by default Ukraine's slightly lost out uh, column inches. The other point I've already made I think is really important is from a report reportage perspective. You can report, you can go there as a foreign correspondent, you can say it's business as usual. Another, The same village was shelled. It's still just on the outskirts of what was Donetsk Airport, rebuilt for Euro 2012, now it's a wreck as you've, many of you will, will know the footage, those things haven't changed. And that exacerbates actually the tragedy for Ukrainians because you know, they thought this was a crisis that might pass, could be a short, sharp conflict. People may have thought it might have been like the Russia-Georgia Russia conflict, which was over pretty quickly in 2008. It's just gone on and on and on. And there's nothing really positive to say about it from the actual conflict. There's nothing dramatic to say about it. It's become a feature of Ukraine's existence. Elliot? Um, yeah, and, you know, I think this is a problem for Ukrainian politics uh, as well. Um, you know, a lot of the political groups I've spoken to here want to increase interest in, in the conflict, but it's it's very difficult when it's it's bubbling away and it's hard to engage a lot of, you know, normal Ukrainians uh, in the conflict, which is on their, on their doorstep. And, but yeah, I, I agree with what Samir has said. I don't have anything really too much to add to that. It was a war of attrition that was going on. It was both 
a proxy and a civil war. Mm. Um, he felt that the EU was not cognizant of future outcomes, and Kiev was faced with a number of challenges. Um, firstly, moving in one direction um, was, uh, collectively, was certainly a challenge. Um, democracy in the absence of um, strong institutions, uh, institutional reform is a very long process, that's another challenge. And then the challenge of national reconciliation. Two years on, what are your thoughts on how Kiev has been addressing those core challenges? Are they being addressed? Yeah. And if so, how? You have a very good memory. Uh, <laughs> yes, exactly. And this, this is a sad thing, actually, about progression or lack of in terms of the conflict. In terms of the battlefield picture and those comments that you, you recalled, you know, it's both a civil war and a proxy war. And so this is an unpopular thing to say in Ukraine, because, of course, for Ukrainians, a lot of patriotic Ukrainians, this is an invasion. But this, is, this has always been my understanding is actually... Yes, there was, of course, uh, there, was, there would have been no war if it wasn't for Russia's regional ambitions and its influence in stirring the pot. Uh, but unfortunately, some of those societal contrasts, maybe a lack of understanding from certain parts of Ukrainian society for other parts, that was the, uh, that was the weakness, the vulnerability that was capitalised on to get the conflict going. Yes, uh, and of course, nothing like armed conflict, uh, it's nothing like armed conflict to polarise opinions and to increase embitterment. Because, of course, people look to displace blame. Some people in Ukraine are going to blame Russia, of course, a lot of people do. Some people in Ukraine blame Kiev. I'm not saying that's right or wrong, uh, but that's what the way in which um, blame has been distributed. And that comes to the point of national reconciliation. Um, there is a reconciliation piece uh, across Ukrainian society as a whole. There's a more focused reconciliation piece across you know, the, the, the line of contact itself because the, the oblast of Donetsk and Luhansk are divided by the front line. And as long as that front line is there, um, we're sort of putting off uh, the moment in which people actually are able to implement, intermingle. There are a lot of, and Elliot probably has some good views on this, a lot of very good grassroots work being done by NGOs and civil society organisations to try to maintain contact between people across uh, the line of contact. But the meta issue, which is actually Ukrainian society's own relationship with itself. We've got, even in Britain, we've got north-south tensions and divides. There's a referendum in Scotland. This is normal as far as um, a larger polity is, is concerned that historically has been comprised of parts that may have had different political affiliations centuries ago. This is normal part of the way politics unfolds. If you throw an armed conflict into, into the mix, then it really, really increases the problems of, of bringing things back down to sort of civil discourse. Elliot, does this resonate with what you've been observing on the ground? Yeah, very, very much so. And um, and you know, I think I've, I'll just limit my comments to the to the N NGOs who I've been engaging with mostly when I've I've been here. And in terms of the U Ukrainian state, you know, I think uh, like things are, are definitely changing. Ukraine is struggling to provide social services um, to most of the the population, you know, displaced or not. Uh, and the NGOs have basically been stepping in as, as service providers uh, with, where the you know, Ministry of uh, Social Policy would have otherwise been um, assisting. I, I had a meeting today with the Ministry of Social Policy and the war, the war impact on their ability to provide social services um, has has been destroyed um, in in huge amounts of, of of Ukraine, and not just in the you know the conflict um, directly of conflict affected regions. And so NGOs have had to had to step in and take you know makes all these services off the the hands of, of the government. And as I mentioned before, the 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 fees the subsidiaries for pensioners and and the uh, the socially poor. Are really, you know, insignificant and and don't allow people to live. So NGOs have had to um, step in and provide housing, clothes, you know, food, uh, everything you can think of. Thank you. Any additional comments or questions? Yes, the lady over there, please. Elena Karachkova, the Global Earth. The question is about um, the Russian Federation blockade of the Mariupol and Berdyansk ports. Uh, in the uh, region of Azov, so would be able to provide the information on this topic, please. Thank you. I know, Elliot, you have some thoughts on this, don't you? Sorry, could you please repeat the question again? I just had problems hearing that, excuse me. <laughs> yes, it's about... It's a it's, the question is about uh, Russian Federation blockade of the Mariupol and Berdyansk uh, ports in the region of Azov Sea. 
Uh, yes. Um, so, yeah, the, the Azov Sea is an interesting um, development. I guess in the last few months, it's been um, more and more of a, of a concern as, um, you know, we've heard reports from the Ukrainian government that Russia has been um, disrupting ships um, going in and out of uh, Ukrainian docks and uh, arbitrarily um, detaining them, boarding them, searching them and disrupting um, trade in the region. And uh, the Ukrainian uh, Ministry of, of Defense have made announcements recently where they're increasing the uh, military deployments um, to the Azov Sea and are looking to set up a, a naval, a, a bigger naval base there. And uh, they've been conducting a lot of drills recently um, to stimulate a, uh, a land invasion from the sea, um, ostensibly to prevent um, you know, Russian... Uh, land invasion from the Azov Sea. So tensions are increasing and, and Russia has even just deployed a couple of warships in the last two weeks um, uh, near uh, uh, Azov City. Um, and so I, I think this, this to me seems like it could develop into a, a situation, you know, maybe if there's an accidental uh, destroying of, of a ship or so, it could really um, escalate into a, a very disastrous conflict um, as well. And it could, you know, again, <laughs> be even more hybrid than it was before. Thank you. Would you like to add anything? Any additional questions, comments? Please, sir. Uh, 10 times. I think it's a reasonable diagnosis implicit in your question, which is this is certainly a conflict of relative rather than absolute gains. Um, you know, there's, I guess speculating as to what the world looks like from the Kremlin is now a sort of a, a hobby that many people take up. So if I just add to that, I think for, from the Russian perspective, it's about trajectory and it's about direction of travel. Um, I think Russia's ability to, to effectively calibrate its level of investment, level of, of loss of prestige in relation to the Ukrainian conflict, which has been considerable, loss of, its, uh, loss of economic power because of the sanctions as well, has also been considerable. And no matter all the speculation in Washington with regards to or sympathies for the Russian government, of course, America can continue to sign off on quite serious sa uh, sanctions package. So without a shred of a doubt, Russia is, is in the realm of, of relative gains. Uh, if you're to put an optimistic Western-hatted spin on it, then Russia is losing far more than it's gaining. I think this has been the difficulty for, for us when we're looking at the possible Russian calculus, is actually to what extent uh, uh, is that a price worth paying for a sense of turning the trajectory of the post-Cold War world of the early 1990s sort of on its head. And uh, as I sort of often point out, four, well, five, six years ago, the idea that many international questions had to pass through Moscow to seek sanction or to seek some kind of, I guess, you know, acquiescence was absurd. Uh, now actually quite a lot in international diplomacy, international diplomacy of war and peace has to pay serious attention to the way in which Russia is, uh, is going on a particular issue. And the last thing I'd say on that particular comment, uh, and it's very much my answer is focused on the Russian side of things here. So I think it's pretty obvious from the Ukrainian perspective that they're, they're the losers in this all. Yeah, is um, I think the, uh, uh, the Russians have also played, looking at the Ukrainian conflicts in relation to their overarching geopolitical game. They've played an interesting uh, double game, which is, my, I prefer the term, rather than hybrid, is hedging. Uh, there's a lot of hedging going on, which is Russia is actually quite facilitative and cooperative in certain issues. You know, back when the, the Iran nuclear deal was something the West was pushing, Lavrov and his team were actually quite conducive to, to cajoling that forward. At the same time, they're involved in Ukraine. And I think from a Russian perspective, it really is, you know, you're, you're looking at a palette, a uh, wide palette of, of engagements around the world. And I guess the Ukrainian, the price uh, imposed on them through Ukraine is probably worth it from their, in their mindset, rather than just being a passive uh, player in their own region, which is what, what they were 10 years ago. Elliot, would you like to add anything on this? 
Just, just very briefly on Samir's um, excellent analysis of the situation. You know, I think more locally, um, the status the status quo certainly is benefit, benefiting some people um, in in Ukraine, and I think. Um, uh, there's been uh, like an increase in, in trafficking around conflict areas and um, then there's definitely some er- enrichment of um, uh, local elites or otherwise um, you know from uh, you know Ill- illegal um, uh, trade and and so forth and and tariffs and 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 such in the conflict areas which are definitely benefiting um, some people economically so there is some interest on on the ground um, to maintain a status uh, quo to Thank you. Any final thoughts, questions from the audience? Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think I've personally learned a great deal from both of you, so thank you, Elliot. Thank you, uh, Samir. Uh, I hope you've also uh, found this uh, useful. Uh, we'll be hosting, as I said, these conflict briefings uh, once a month. And although it's the 2nd of November, this was our October briefing. Watch out for the details of the next uh, conflict briefing, which will take place later in November, and we'll focus on the, uh, on the Philippines. Uh, also, please do share with us any feedback you might have. Uh, we have a dedicated uh, email address, conflictbriefing at iss.org. So any thoughts on how we can uh, provide you with more useful uh, data through our armed conflict database and our conflict, other conflict-related analysis, please do let us know. And uh, as I also mentioned earlier, there is a recording of this event that will be made uh, public on our uh, website uh, very shortly. We actually aim to run these events both as physical events and also as webinars. We had some technical issues today, so that was not uh, possible. But going forward, you'll also be able to, uh, to join us uh, remotely. So thank you again. Uh, but before you leave, please join me in thanking Elliot and Samir.